Hello and welcome to the conversation today with Tom Richardson, who is a clinical psychologist. Um, thank you for being a part of the series, Tom. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, so I guess to ask why, why is it important to you to speak in this series? Well, I've always been um, very interested in the work that you've done and I've always been really glad to see more open discussions about mental health professionals with their own, you know, mental mm. health problems, lived experience. And just for me, throughout the years, my kind of my career and my mental health have kind of been really intertwined. Um, so I think it's, it, it'd just be interesting to discuss this and I really hope that it might help other people um, if they're kind of struggling maybe with what to do and how open to be, which I know I have in the past. That's fantastic. Thank you. And uh, there'll be many voices in this series who will be alongside each other talking exactly to that very thing. Um, so perhaps you could take me through maybe how it all started. So um, I, I've got a, kind of a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Um, and this it, my first episode was when I was 18. So just after I finished my A-level. So I was really interested in psychology. I was a bit of a teacher's pet. Uh, when it came to that and I was planning to do you know psychology um, at university um, I was interested in clinical psychology I hadn't really thought that far ahead at that point but um, you know I had friends who had gone through mental health problems um, so I was just really keen and then basically uh, a lot of things happened where a lot of things came together where I kind of I was working for my levels and then that was stopped and um, I was kind of not doing much like waiting for my gap year to start um, and I was a little bit of an idiot and I kind of thought I deferred my place to university and I hadn't and I realized that about well I realized that when they rang me in Freshers Week and said why haven't you registered so I kind of ended up with like no university place yeah um, so a lot of things happened and you know my my partner now wife went to university I ended up following her to Dublin but she'd gone off so it was just massive life changes and um, it, I just, I basically, I had this, I mean, it feels like it escalated very quickly, but when you look back, there were a lot of warning signs for, you know, a good few weeks that I wasn't quite right. Mm. You know, I'd um, had a really exciting gig in a band I was in and I was lots of ideas and energy, um, but it really kind of came to a head where I, I'd saved up some money just kind of working a, a job and like, doing breakfast shifts in a hotel. And I went to a friend who had loads of this, because I've always been a bit musical, and uh, he had loads of musical equipment, loads of like recording and synths and stuff. And I remember we were just making music. I thought, oh, I've got a few hundred quid saved. Maybe I could buy this. And literally over the course of that night, it went from, I'm going to buy myself a bit of recording equipment for my computer to, I'm going to set up an international business empire with like a recording studio and restaurants and bars that are linked. And it was going to be international. And... I mean, those days are a bit of a blur, but I know that I met people I hadn't seen from school I hadn't seen for a while. They were going to be my executive something. Uh, I was offering people on the street a job. I rang up the bank and was tried to speak to them about a loan. Luckily, I, I was in hospital before I actually had that meeting. Um, yeah, I just it's just completely escalated and... Um, you know, it was really just intense kind of couldn't sleep. So my my family ended up, my, my parents kind of realised something was wrong. So I ended up kind of getting, yeah, taken into hospital really. Um, I wasn't sectioned, but, um, you know, I could have been if I hadn't have gone willingly. But I was still, it was very much like I was there still writing out my business plans and all of this stuff. But it didn't, the penny didn't drop for a long, long time. So I, I was really, you know, I was manic, I was in hospital, I mean, unfortunately, that's the only time I've been in hospital. Um, you know, my my partner came over in a freshers' week, and um, you know, it was really difficult. My psychology teacher, the teacher's pet, came to visit me in the ward. Um, I was kind of there, go. Oh, I'm really interested, and I I saw a clinical psychologist when I was discharged, which was really helpful trying to make sense of what happened. Um, so it took me a good few months to recover. I ended up having my gap year. Um, I kind of thought it was a one-off, really. Um, so I went to university in Dublin, and I started, and it was all going well, and I found my love, and I embraced my geeky side of psychology. And then kind of in 
there was one point where I, I felt like I was taking on too much and I, I felt a little bit like my mind was racing and I remember just speaking to one of the doctors, but it was okay. Uh, it was really into my final year where things really escalated and again, a sort of trigger for me was lots of life changes and boredom. So I'd been doing loads and loads of, I'd been working as a support worker and getting my dissertation up and running and research system and lots of stuff. Um, tendency to bite off more than I can chew. Um, and then that all stops and uh, things really calmed down and I, I started, my mind started racing. I had loads of energy again and yeah, the irony, this is why it comes, start talking about how it relates to my career. Um, I got, I literally got sort of hypermanic about my dissertation about hypermanic. <laughs> so, yeah. You lived it. You I lived did. your dissertation. Yeah. I, I really did. Um, I remember my supervisor saying, this is a really, it's a bit of a niche topic you've got here. Why are you interested? <laughs> and kind of going, oh, uh, it's just interesting. Um, and I, I hadn't really told anyone at that point, you know, my close friends knew and my my um, my family knew, but I wasn't sort of, I, I told some people, I wasn't too open about it. I just kind of need to know. But that was the first time I really thought, oh God, this might actually be, you know, this isn't a one-off, is it? And at that point, I saw a psychiatrist and they were like, you know, you've had two kind of manic episodes. So, you know, we'd say you're bipolar now. Looking back, I definitely had one when I was 16 as well. Mm. Um, it just wasn't picked up at the time. You know, at a festival and had this ridiculous business idea and didn't sleep and I'd injured myself, but I was still, you know, at a festival. It was, yeah. So in retrospect, it had definitely been there since about the age of 16. Um, so yeah, yeah, it kind of was on medication. It kind of settled down a little bit. And um, now I graduated, started my assistant psychologist job. Um, ironically, my first kind of supervisor when I was a research assistant uh, knew my parents. Um, He's a clinical psychologist and he knew my parents and uh, he was actually at my mum's 50th birthday party when I was on leave from the psychiatric ward to go to my mum's 50th. Um, mm -hmm. So I remember seeing him and I was, you know, I was really not well. You know, they let me go out for a few hours, which was really kind of them, but I was, um, you know, still really high as a kite. And uh, I remember him saying, how are you doing and everything? And he was my supervisor and we never mentioned it. We never talked about it. And I look back now and I go, that's strange. And I remember even we were away for like a conference and they were saying some, there was four of us sitting around a table and uh, someone said something about, oh, you know, one in four people apparently, you know, has a mental health problem. I was just like going, this is my moment. No, say it. No, don't say it. No, don't say it. No, what if he, oh, can't let the cat back. Um, so I never discussed it with him, which seems a bit... Strange. Um, but yeah, so I was kind of, again, you know, carried on my career towards um, clinical psychology and I started being interested in bipolar disorder and doing little bits of research and publishing bits kind of about bipolar disorder, about hypermania, that kind of thing. Um, and interestingly, throughout my career, it's not been the, the big life events like getting married and having children haven't made me unwell. It's very much life events related to my career that really push on that failure button, you know, not good enough. Um, really? Yeah. Those are the ones that seem to get me. So it's very much related to my career, like I was saying. So hypermanic about my dissertation about hypermania. Um, when I was on the doctor, a, a, a big trigger for me becoming quite kind of like a bit of a mixed episode, I'd call it, um, was I, I, you know, I was proud research geek and wanted to do research as part of my career and um, we had a research project and um, yeah. a research project and I failed it um, and it was real shock to the system because I was like oh god I thought I was good at this and you know you end up doubting yourself and no one thought I'm not good enough and that was kind of a bit of a a bit of a trigger there where I ended up going to the GP um, there was probably times I should have got help soon, to be honest. No times where I was really so unwell, I don't think I should have been working, but I, I should have reached out for help before. But I kind of I kind of floated under secondary mental health services, you know, 
because I was under them when yeah. I was 18. But then at university, it was all, it was in another country. So it was all done through the university. And then, you know, when I was an assistant, a research assistant, it, my GP was also a psychiatrist. So he just kind of took care of me. I didn't, so I kind of floated very much below, if that makes sense. But I, I probably yeah. should have got more help earlier. But I was just really worried about what would happen. What would happen if I, like, you know, you, Especially when you're on the doctorate, because it's very intense. You know, you, you, you get someone who literally ticks a, a pass or fail a placement. You're being constantly evaluated. Yeah. So I was really, I want to see us catastrophizing. I see it as catastrophizing now, but at the time I didn't. What was going to happen? Am I going to say I'm fit to practice automatically? So I even go into my GP, I was really anxious about not being told. Um, and it really stopped me getting help when I, you know, when I should have. Um, so I think about halfway through the doctor, I ended up telling my tutor and the head of the doctor, and um, they were really nice, really supportive, and uh, not actually very surprised to be quite honest. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they kind of said um, they, they said, "Oh, you you have a lot of ideas, and you're always taking on a lot, and." publishing stuff and oh this makes sense now yeah it's gonna make sense um but the, the way they put it which is always really nice and i was trying to bear in mind was you know you know what sets you off and you know kind of what happens when you come on well so actually from where we're sitting that's really helpful you know yeah. um so that was really good it was like a big kind of release and i i told it i told a handful of people I was close to in my, you know, training cohort. Um, uh, so that was nice to be able to say about that. I had never told anyone on placement until my very last one. Um, and it, in, so this is my last placement. So I was kind of like 27 then. Um, I never had depression. I just had kind of hypermanic manic episodes. Um, and I had this kind of, I think, quite a hypermanic, again, career. <laughs> hypermanic writing spree of my dissertation where I just wrote um, you know I really was just productive and just wrote a lot and in retrospect maybe I was a little bit manic and then I handed it in and I just crashed um, oh, oh. and I was in supervision and I just kind of ended up crying and I told my supervisor then what had happened like, you know the context um, but I didn't know I was depressed I don't know. I didn't. I didn't realise it. Even though, like, final year, special interest in bipolar disorder, final year trainee, I didn't realise I was depressed until I was really quite deep in it. You know, um, I didn't quite grasp what was going on. Um, so I ended up sort of saying to my supervisor, not in the best way. Maybe it wasn't a like planned thing, um, but you know, she needed to know. Um, in retrospect, maybe I should have taken a few weeks off. But at the time, it was again, what's going to happen? No, I'm not going to qualify on time, catastrophize, catastrophize, you know. Um, so, yeah, that was that was really, that was a difficult placement. Um, but I kind of, my I ended up coming out the other side and um, the university organised me some kind of remote therapy with one of the other 10 sites on another course in the country, which was very useful just to kind of understand a little bit more about why it had been set off and my warning signs. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Which is really helpful. And, um, we spoke about before hmm. when, when we were talking about, um, that some of the feelings it kind of raised in you to be a trainee clinical psychologist at that time, experiencing, a mental health difficulty and I, I found a real resonance with my experience as well and other people's that I've heard around some ideas of shame in there and real anxiety. It's like I, I, yeah, I think I bought into the myth that we should be you know we should be able to sort ourselves out right you know so you can it's a yourself. big myth <laughs> it is. yeah for anyone it's ridiculous in retrospect, but I, I think I think one of the 
you know, I've been on and off medication. I don't, I'm not on any regular medication at the moment, you know. Um, but uh, I think one of the reasons I was maybe resistant to it was, oh, I should be able to cope by myself, um, which is ridiculous. You know, I'm a psychologist. I should be able to cope by myself, and which is ridiculous because medication has been really, really essential at times for me to stop me, you know, getting so unwell. I was in hospital again, to be honest. Um, but yeah, no, I think it was that. It was, um, I should be able to know more. <laughs> I, I, I should be able to cope. Um, but I think there's a reason a lot of us go into this. I mean, certainly my, you know, going into a psychiatric ward in my gap year certainly made me more interested in, I was already interested in psychology. This definitely pushed me towards clinical psychology. <laughs> <laughs> My yeah. special research interests are bipolar disorder, <laughs> one of them. Um, and it's interesting. Actually, I also I I understand that. I understand yeah. that because some of the things that I've looked into or been the most interested in are quite close to the knuckle of my experience. Mm. Um, other people do too. Um, and, and, you know, that, that changes over time depending on kind of how close you want to be to it or not. And, you know, there's loads of choices and decisions that we we can you know quite rightly and happily make around that there's and also those shoulds as well those shoulds when you're on training i should be like this i should I be, be fine i should be able to you know because i read books um on this very intellectual level just that purely engaging with this intellectual level <laughs> to change something about the impacts of life's challenges on my whole embodied self and my psyche and you yeah. know my, my well, human actually, for, for me, overthinking it is part of the problem. <laughs> you know, oh. <laughs> you know yeah, intellectualizing yeah. it. I mean, that's sometimes I think that's yeah. the problem is yeah. I overthink things. And yeah, I, yeah, yeah, that's I that's what I understood. More, more yeah. present, more emotional. Um, but you know, it's interesting what you're saying about um, your kind of special interests. I remember telling a colleague before, and she was like, "No." Uh, yeah, I did wonder about your special interest. You always wonder when someone has a special interest. So, yeah. Um, I, you know, again, I remember this same colleague before I'd told her, because when I was qualified, she'd said to me, um, say, well, she was something like, you, how do you get all these ideas and have this much energy? And I just kind of make a joke. And I remember someone going, Tom, like, what are you on? And I was just like, oh, you know, just like... <laughs> I'm passing into the coffee. That's all I need. Was that kind of thing, jokingly, obviously. And then, in, and then, when I was more open, because I had to tell them actually, there's a bit of a context. But there's a reason we go into it, and sometimes it's our own experiences. Sometimes it's you know loved ones who have had those problems. Um, yeah. But it, what you're saying, it, I, I think I, I really like being interested in bipolar disorder and having that experience. And um, of course, it's not essential. I, I just think it gives me a different perspective. You know, I kind of like say to people, you know. I, I'm interested in bipolar disorder as a researcher and as a clin clinician and as a service user, you know, triple threat, all three. Um, and it, of course it's not essential, but it, it does give me a different perspective because sometimes the research ideas I have start with something I've noticed, you know, in my own kind of experience. And then I look at the literature and I go, oh, maybe that's, you know, so a lot I've done is around bipolar disorder and financial difficulties and impulse spending and that's very much came from my own um it kind of evolved out of my dissertation which is about student tuition fees and mental health but then i was thinking about how when i was manic i impulsively spent um to buy furniture for this recording studio i was going to have and all of this stuff and random massive djembe african drums and all this stuff and i was like there's not much written about this even though people say when you're manic you spend 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 no one's thinking about sort of why this is so that's definitely fueled some of my interest there and i think most of the time it's helpful there are times when it it's really hard though i am um, like when i was on my final placement and i was in an inpatient ward and you know when people are really really hopeless and suicidal and you're feeling really hopeless it's quite hard you know it, it's it is harder to kind of your resilience goes down and you know there's times when someone goes oh you know everything's just really crap and if you're really down it's kind of it is you know <laughs> you kind of think it, in your mind you almost say that to yourself um what helped um well i think for me just being more aware of 
for me, therapy and dealing with that myself has helped really. I mean, there have been times when I've intentionally tried to kind of face my demons. So I ended up, when I was a research assistant, volunteering just a couple of hours a week at the inpatient ward. I had been a patient in a few years before. Yeah. Um, I kind of, it was a bit of a test to me, like, if I can do this, like, I'll be okay as a clean site, maybe. Um, How was it? How was it for you? It, I really enjoyed doing it. Um, but again, again, it was quite scary at first. I remember it brought back quite a lot of memories. And um, I remember this nurse going, I really recognize you. Do I know you? <laughs> no, 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 no. I have an identical twin brother, so it's like, maybe it's my twin um, <laughs> I was on the roster, but I wasn't the star side. <laughs> I was on the other yeah, exactly. bit of paper. And um, she, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't say anything. I, I thought maybe she doesn't know me in that way. But in the end, I just thought, no, I'm not being honest here. I told occupational health and everyone, you know, um, but I, the person who was supervising me, I told him, he, he basically just said, look, I think most people who go into what you're doing have their own reasons for it. And, you know, I'm glad you can be here. So that was, that was really nice. Um, and I do sometimes tell service users, but I always do it. I think very carefully about it. Um, I do it. You've got to make sure that it's, it's for, for them, not for you, you know? Um, but there have been some patients when people, it's really hard to connect with someone or they're kind of just like really hoping saying you don't get it. And there have been times when I have said, you know, I do, and I do really think about it carefully and I always take it to supervision and that's really helped. And there have been other times when um, patients have sussed me out. <laughs> I was running a bipolar they've, group. They've sussed you out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, of course. And, and, I, and I hope, I'd like to think, I hope not, I, I don't think, because I was actually unwell at the time and they were worried about me, but I was running a bipolar group and one of the people said, Tom, all of our thinking patterns, is, this is like, you know, 10 people in the room, are so A to Z and kind of all over the place and wacky sense of humour and uh, you just get it. You're not bipolar, are you? And everyone laughed and I just kind of awkwardly laughed. So I didn't want to lie, but I didn't, think that was the best time to say yes um and then when i saw her one-to-one -one a few weeks later i did say yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> but that was that's, that's the always, case yes <laughs> yeah, but that's always tickled me um so there's kind of but i think it really reached a different phase um i think it's probably about four years ago so i was qualified for about three years then or two or three years um like I didn't tell, I told who I needed, to, I told, told you needed to know when I started my um, qualified job and I stayed in the same place. Um, I told occupational health and everything completely open with them. After a, a couple of years, I told my kind of professional manager and my line manager, um, they were very understanding. And then I, eventually I did kind of tell everyone. And the way I did it was I, I said, I'm not going to, I was taught teaching about the psychology of bipolar disorder. Um, and this model, which I found really helpful for understanding it, I was like showing a formulation of that model. And I actually just put my initial manic episode on there. Um, and I just thought, Brilliant. I'm not, I'm yeah, kind of, because you don't want it to be like, look at me. Um, I thought, I'm not going to go out and I'm not going to do this talk thinking I'm going to say it. But if it comes up, I'm going to say it, you know? So I was kind of giving myself the option. Um, so I went through, I talked about this formulation in initial manic episode, all the stuff I've talked to you about losing place at university and this stuff. Um, and then at the end, any questions? And one of my colleagues just went, that guy you were talking about, how are you doing now? <laughs> I, was, I was like, well, um, that's an interesting point. So I told them all. And it was really liberating. And then I, you know, put a big thing on Facebook where I was friends with lots of people from work just saying about it. And it was a really nice reaction because, you know, I, um, I told a couple of people before, you know, who had kind of maybe figured something out and that felt quite nice, but it was like a, a shared little secret, you know, sort of, mm. and it shouldn't be like that. Um, but when I did just completely sort of come out with it, um, people were really nice because they were just like, oh, God, I wouldn't have guessed. Um, and that makes sense while you're interested in this stuff, uh, while you're interested, why this is a special interest. And then a lot of people think about their own struggles as well, you know? 
yeah. which they didn't feel like they could talk about. Um, so yeah. I'm fortunate now that I'm in a place where I am open about it and everyone knows. And people have said to me, are you okay, Tom? I've noticed, you know, it seems like your mind's racing a bit and you're a little bit on the go today. Are you okay? Mm. Much better for keeping myself well. Because the problem is when you keep it all locked up and all that kind of shame like it's a dirty secret, you won't tell anyone until you really have to. So the whole idea of prevention early intervention becomes so much harder, you know? Um, so it's, it's nice that I can be open about it um, and that my managers ask how are you doing and I can share my relapse prevention plan um, so that that was a, a really important kind of place to be and I think it was around that time I, I kind of started to notice myself becoming unwell it wasn't related to that I can't remember I can't remember the time scales. Anyway, around kind of a few years ago as well, I started to become unwell and um, I ended up going into secondary care for the first time since I was 18. Um, so that was interesting as well because, you know, I, it was, I was a patient at the place where I'd been on placement you know, a few years before and um, mm. I knew some of the psychiatrists a little bit professionally from when I was on placement. Um, and they were fine. They were just they noted that they're like, I know, I know you in another context. Is this okay? Yes, it is. Um, and they were really nice. And I feel like, you know, I felt like they, I was taken care of, and everyone was very compassionate and respectful. And you know, I think in a good way, there was a bit of it, one of our own, you know. Um, but it, it did make me laugh as well when <laughs> the psychiatrist said, because I'd had kind of little bits of therapy, but not kind of full on. The psychiatrist said, okay. So let me get this right. Uh, you know, so we've got medication. What about psychological therapy? And I said, yeah, I'd really, I really appreciate that. I'd really find that helpful. Okay. So I'm going to go to my clinical psychology colleagues and ask for someone to do CBT for bipolar disorder with an expert in CBT for bipolar disorder. They're going to love me, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so what happened? <laughs> so yeah, it was, and it was a bit, um, it was a bit difficult because I, we, it was like uh, we had to go through a list of do you know this person? Do you know this person? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I, I ended up being assessed by someone who I, I'd kind of known a little bit for meetings, and that was fine actually. I, I didn't mind after the first couple of times. And then they ended up, so they ended up, um, my the psychologist I saw, um, who's amazing. So I, I, I teach for the CBT for bipolar disorder part of the CBT diploma. Um, so I do the teaching for that. Um, and I use my own experiences. I kind of do smatter it with my own experiences and the feedback I get is that's really helpful, which is really nice. Um, but the first time I did that, she was doing the diploma and then two years later, she was my therapist. So basically like <laughs> she'd learned how to do CBT for bipolar disorder from me and then was trying to do CBT for bipolar disorder from me. So again, we, we just kind of named it and, um, I, I think that's the only thing you can do, isn't it? Yeah. She said, <laughs> it's out. okay. And I just said, look, it's, I know I, I have the potential to be the worst patient ever if I'm <laughs> it. I'm not going to be there with my therapy rating scale going, no, 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 you should have asked it like this. Um, but actually what was really good is she worked in a slightly different way for me. And like I was saying, I maybe prone to a bit of overthinking things and therapy-wise, I'm, I'm quite cognitive. I talk a lot about thoughts. Um, and she was worked in a different way and a lot more kind of an emotional level and compassionate level. And just so coming from a different angle um, was really, really, um, really helpful. It was life-changing. It really was. And it's, it's interesting when we were saying about, you know, you should be able to understand. I never quite understood why I was like this and why I had all these high standards and drive and got to achieve more, 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 more. Yeah. I never understood where that came from until I, you know, until I had therapy and I realized actually it kind of went back to some difficult times at school where I felt very different, a bit bullied. Um, mm. So my way of kind of overcompensating was right. I'm going to be really different in a good way and really independent and overachieved. Doesn't matter what you think. 
so going on this kind of renegade manic start my own thing is very much related to that if that makes sense you know it doesn't matter what you think i'm gonna do my own thing be feisty independent um and overachieve and i think yes i didn't realize that despite you know the papers i published the fact that i taught because you can't can't therapize yourself it's that old expression of can't see the wood for the trees it's um, exactly my being an analysis um mm. analysis in 2007 a year before i started training and been in it for a very long time it's an intentionally long-term endeavor journey um and there's no way there's absolutely no way i i there's just no way i could have got to some of the stuff that we've got to on my own through self-reflection yeah um it's not that yeah i don't know i I just i just couldn't and i wasn't in there i wasn't in there just to explore i needed help um so i i I really you know i needed help so um it was incredibly invaluable to have another person kind of alongside me and the fit was good so i was lucky i know some people see a few people before they perhaps find somebody that they they really fit with and i think that's just as important and it's something about the fit that you said you know with with the the lady that you saw you know the difference yeah she just really got it and we worked together but she yeah Yeah. um, coming from a different angle you know and yeah um suggesting things in therapy that i wouldn't have thought of it's really useful but it was was kind of like started formulation she was like tom why don't you go away and work on this formulation because i know you're really like getting into it okay so i go and work and do lots of diagrams and arrows and then bring it back and she go okay this is good you know so yeah it worked well but it was was, um, that was the first time i'd gone into kind of a proper period of therapy rather than kind of i'd done bits and bobs like online therapy and a few sessions here a few sessions there um really has life changed that whole the whole kind of motor of high standards just slowed down and all of this i I remember saying to when i was initially assessed uh, i was saying all this part of me that you know more 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 again it's related to my career i get manic about publishing stuff in my career and grants and all this stuff you know um and i've become nearly unwell when i've had good news about a research grant and it makes my head explode um so it's kind of a very interesting relationship, but it really kind of wound that down and focusing on what really matters to me, my values, rather than that highest achievement. And I remember it got really brought home to me when I said I was part of me that would just keep going more, 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 and it would never be enough. And um, she said, oh, it, you know, it, it's not dissimilar to an anorexia where it's like I'm going for this weight and then when you get to it, oh, I'm going to go a bit lower, go a bit lower, and, you know, it's that same kind of searching for a goal and you just move the goalpost so it's yeah. just been so helpful yeah. to really reevaluate my relationship with my career and not place as much emphasis on ticking boxes and reaching goals um yeah. but i don't think it's made me it hasn't made me any more unproductive i remember saying what's your fear about therapy any, any worries i'm worried that i'm going to get so relaxed i'm just going to not be bothered about my work anymore you know <laughs> Yeah. That, that yeah, belief that in my yeah. self-critical high standards is useful when it's not. Um, so it, I, I now it's, there, there are times when I do find myself, you know, saying I'm not good enough and I've got to work harder and it's still something I live with, but that drive to kind of overachieve, which was a double-edged sword in terms of my career, it's like boom and bust, definitely. Um, it's just wound down. I, I remember saying to her at the end, it's like I've, been training my life to get an Olympic gold in my career and I've just realised I just like running. <laughs> it doesn't really matter what you know. That's brilliant. That's you know, in brilliant. terms of just, yeah. Yeah. So trying to focus on what I'm doing, why it matters. Um, so yeah, no, I'm now at the stage which is really fortunate where I'm, I'm not under the mental health team and I'm not on any regular medication. And I still have bumps and I still um I still kind of live with it, of course, but it's nice to be open. You know, I, I'm looking at a letter I wrote here, which is literally called The Dark Side of Being a Clinical Psychologist with Bipolar Disorder. Is that published? It is, yeah. 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 Can we get taking... resources on Integrate Mental Health, please? Uncle? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank was, you. And that was in response to some uh, thin psych saying that 
he'd had hypermania and it was fine, it didn't cause any problems. And I kind of said, well, it's a double-edged sword because, yeah, I can see it. There's been times when it's helped me be productive in my career. And there's been times when it's led to depression and big problems. And mm. I think before therapy, and I, I remember writing this, I, um, I this is what I wrote in the paper before I had therapy. So this is back in 2016. Uh, I live in constant fear that my ambition, passion, and energy for clinical psychology will escalate into a career-destroying manic episode. Um, and I really did feel that fear, like, when's this going to happen? If I go into yeah. hospital again, my God, what's going to happen to my career? Um, but after therapy, that is, I don't feel like I live in that fear again. I, I'm not saying it's never going to happen. I just, I hope it won't. And I'm, But it's just that more kind of present taking you know less of that catastrophizing about what's going to happen because again i think you're catastrophizing about the worst case scenario where you end up getting you know told you're not fit to practice and that kind of thing and yeah. actually i uh, the vast majority of all my experiences of telling colleagues has been overwhelmingly positive um and there's times where i end up you know i now speak to trainees about well-being and your own mental health and um, you know, sometimes and getting involved with workplace wellness and sometimes a kind of a supporting role in terms of people who are struggling with their own things. So it does feel that's like fantastic. Like yeah. A different relationship. Um, yeah. It's, I've, I've, I've found a lot of what you say really moving and from, from, from very different from a, a very different perspective from my lived experience, which is different to yours. I can understand um, the idea of kind of striving, striving in some way and um, from, from a different point, for different reasons and, and the sense of good enough at the base of that, which kind of propels you on and on and potentially yeah. into quite a dark space. It's like a running joke in our group supervision um, that like it's in the job description in the person spec for being a clinic is to like have a core belief that I'm a failure and then try to overcompensate. Um, but it is yeah. so, you know, and it is because it, it's so competitive to get onto the doctor, isn't it? Um, it, it just it leads you to compare yourself to others and think I'm not good enough. I'm never going to get on. And then the doctor is intense and you're constantly under a microscope. So um, yeah, I think there's a lot of people, I think, you know, we do have a lot of self-critical thoughts and high standards in our profession and for some people that's, you know, clinical to the extent that it's a mental health problem. So um, I think it's okay to own our slight perfectionism. <laughs> um, we try. I think yeah. we try. Yeah. It's, I, it's, the, it's the only important thing really to to have spaces. I've certainly found this where you are allowed to come back down to your humanity. Yeah. You know, and I really does feel like I come back down to it because striving pushes you into places that are extremely uncomfortable mm. and uh, quite harmful, really. So, yeah. I think the other thing doing therapy that I realised was um, I never really appreciated for my patients how exhausting it is. Oh, my yeah. God. I oh, do it, it at takes nine of, not the day out, not yeah. the day out. Sometimes I do it at nine o'clock you know, in the Monday morning, and then I'd have to drive. You do? To, well, I did when I had it, yeah. And then oh I had to drive, God. and I had like an eleven o'clock meeting, twelve thirty meeting, two o'clock patient, three o'clock. Oh my! And I, uh, mm. yeah, in my motion. I don't know how you did that. I could have never have done it in the morning. I always had to yeah. do it in the evening when at least I knew I could go home and rest. And then yeah. sleep. Well, no, I ended up saying to my manager, like, I'm not doing these two meetings. I'm going to pick or choose because this is exhausting. And I, I need to yeah. just kind of sit, have a cup of tea and just have coffee and just stare at the wall. <laughs> you know? And um, that's the work, isn't it? That's why it can't, you know, you can't be reading a book and, and feel like it can kind of fix you in some kind of way. It is embodied, full, sometimes cellular work. It is mm. that some of these things go that deep in, into you. They become, well, they feel like they could become in a very intrinsic part of you unless we can be aware and kind of, uh, in language that I would use, kind of bring them to consciousness and, and kind of check those out and test them out and understand why they got there in the first place. It's, mm. it's, it's surgical. It, it feels, yeah, you know, yeah. psychologically surgical. Yeah. Some, yeah. And I think I... That's given me definitely, it's been useful to be on it from the other side and um, 
think about just how how hard work it is. Kind of it kind of breaks you down and then builds you back up again. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. But I never really quite realised it. So um, understanding what my patients go through at a different level. Um, and yeah, there's, and I know I'm fortunate because I know a lot of people that you know struggles a lot more than me. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I struggle like a lot of the people with bipolar or do I pro- struggle with because I've only been in hospital once and I'm fortunate that I am kind of well. Um, that's the imposter syndrome talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pain, pain, yeah. It, it's really difficult, that one. At the heart of it, pain, when you're in it, that pain itself, whoever's got it, for whatever reason, is just not comparable. It's just pain. It's just people in pain, and and when we can get alongside that, whoever's in pain, and then we can at least understand some commonality, whilst sometimes understanding that when we're when we're in role in a system, we we do have powers and privileges that are different in those yes. roles that we have to be mindful of. Um, and, and to some extent, maybe some some of that is some kind of health privilege to a certain extent. I, I don't know. Maybe that's something that you're bringing up. Um, you know, some people have consistently been not well enough to work. Um, mm. So perhaps haven't got, haven't reached those stages uh, through education or, or, you know, other means to get to the point where they are able to have the option to even yeah. think about doing what they want. Um, so I think, it, it, I think we have to hold all of it as compassionately as possible and still feel that we have the right to speak to our pain. Um, yeah. You know, and, way, or have a whole range of experiences around that. When I do say to patients, again, I do it very cautiously and sparingly, and only if I really think it will help them. Um, I always sort of prefix it with, like, I, I know I'm, I'm not in your shoes, so I don't know exactly what you're going through. And can I just say, from a personal level, you know, like, I get it that therapy is hard. I might even say my diagnosis, I might say, I've, I've been through therapy, I know it's hard work, or, um, I know what it's like with these high standards, you know, I kind of have the same thing. Um, and it's, it, it's, I've never had a patient with one badly to be telling them, you know, that I've never had anyone, which is really nice. I've never had anyone say, Oh, you know, that's not appropriate or something. I, I've never had a bad reaction from a patient. Um, everyone always that's not, I'm just thinking patient. about your research. Sorry, sorry. I was just thinking about your your kind of you know research interests, and and that's you know a, a slowly growing area of research there about mm. um, sharing within the therapeutic relationship itself, which of course has a different frame and intention around it, around sharing. Um, if you, if you're in the role of professional at that time, um, and you know perhaps there needs to be more in that area to understand. I think I think it's. Uh, it's a, yeah. you know, all of this, there's, there's so much richness for understanding more, but also to come back to the point of view that, you know, things don't always have to go into these big research, um, research plans, you know, that, that people speaking from their lived experience is so powerful, you mm-hmm. know, and ha- has the effect that it does uh, to help us kind of forward knowledge, almost like an ethnography in a way. Um, that's what I hope from from these from these yeah. conversations in this series, and and I, I just I hope you do help people because I just wish like if I just had someone who was a, a qualified to like say to me when I was in my second year of training, it's all right to struggle, it's all right to have a mental health problem. You don't, you know, I've been there, and you're not going to get chucked off the course. You just need to get help and that kind of thing. I that would be that would have just given me the confidence to really get help. Because I was alone with it. It was, you know, all this completely unwarranted shame, like it's a dirty secret. And um, I didn't get help when I needed it. Um, and the reaction was so positive in the end. So I, I wish that someone had just said to me, it's all right. But I didn't know anyone who was in that position. So if mm-hmm. anyone... And that's what it, we want to change. That is, Do the absolutely. Work we've already been doing. Yeah. Already been doing. And other allies have already been doing. You know, just... Absolutely. You know, it's, all, it's, it's almost just, it's just not rocket science, is it? No, it's, <laughs> it's just getting messages but, out that have been silenced. This is my official NHS lanyard. Oh, there you are. Oh my badge. god, I just realized yeah. you're showing me the badge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fantastic. So I got another I, request I, this morning. I wear this 
and people often say, what's that about? And I just say, it's to say that I've got lived experience and I'm willing to talk to people. They are, and yeah, I'm part of kind of um, discussions about supporting their own staff. So um, it's yeah. nice just to be kind of open about it. It takes the power away from it, you know. Mm. Yes. Brilliant. I just thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I really hope that people listening to this, wherever they are in their, in their career within the mental health professions, or even if they're just a member of the public watching, or, or you know, just to perhaps from my point of view, take away from it that we're, we're all in this together. We're all human and we're trying to help understand how to destigmatize mental health difficulties from the inside, as well as alongside all the time to change um, campaigns that you see. And is, is there anything else that you would like to say before we finish? Um, I, I, no, I don't think so. I mean, maybe just to say that, that like you were alluding to there, I think that boundary between patient and you know someone with mental health problems, it's not too distinct groups of it. You know, like I said, a lot of people will go into this because of their own experiences or their mm-hmm. family or friends. Um, and I think that's obviously we need to observe our own boundaries and everything as professionals. And um, it's okay to be a, be a service to as well. Um, it doesn't make you any less of a clinician who doesn't make you um, a fraud as I maybe thought to myself yeah yeah Yeah. same (laughs) thank you so much Tom alright take care take care bye bye